The theoretical origin of political life and consent or contract implies for them, implies for them not only that governments are made, but that they can be unmade. Not only that individuals opt in, but that they may, under some conditions anyway, opt out. That is precisely what they're doing in exercising their so-called right of revolution. Now, the situation of the American founding generation, of which Lincoln is speaking in this opening paragraph, is importantly parallel to the situation of Lincoln's own generation. Because the South was claiming the right of opting out of the nation into which they had opted in, in 1776 or 1788, wherever you want to date that. The South appealed to the authority and indeed the example of our fathers in attempting to leave the Union. While Lincoln, in resisting their effort to secede, would seem to be resisting the authority of the very fathers to whom he is appealing. Many of Lincoln's pre-Gettysburg pronouncements have been devoted to challenging this attempt by the seceders to cloak themselves in the authority of our fathers indeed. And that is a theme to which he returns in the second paragraph in which I'm going to sort of follow him to do when he, when he does that. Now, although Lincoln many times denied the legitimacy of secession, he recognized, and I think this paragraph is meant to be a, 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 a mode of that, he recognized the natural tendency of persons who believed a political society to be voluntarily constructed, that is starting with the principle that all men are created equal, People who believe that would naturally tend to believe that it could also be voluntarily deconstructed. The nation may begin as a voluntary compact, but what but Lincoln is saying, what is thereby born is not a mere voluntary association from which one rightly resigns when membership becomes onerous or distasteful. The nation that is born on the basis of human equality and social compact creates bonds that genuinely bind. This is not a mere association of convenience where one may leave at will. It is more like an organic, an organic, I should say, entity that may not be dismembered. The parts are no longer merely autonomous and whole as they were originally before they joined up. The theory of secession may be a temptation in this regime dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, but it is not a correct inference from it. That's what Lincoln is saying, not a correct inference from the original equality. Lincoln's odd and jarring use of what, I'm, what sometimes is referred to as obstetric imagery in the Gettysburg Address is meant to convey this thought, I think. Although one can opt in, one cannot opt out in the normal course of things. The nation made by our fathers is a genuine whole, and the elements of it are organs, not autonomous entities. For a state to claim a right to leave the union is like the heart or the lungs trying to leave the body. The jarring denaturalization of the natural process of conception and birth that Lincoln effects reflects and embodies just this odd situation. The understanding of the state as an artifact produces the same degree of organic wholeness and integrity as a more strictly naturalistic understanding of the origin of the polity would do. Lincoln's denatured naturalism actually points to the naturalized artificiality of the state. Lincoln thus emphasizes the organic or quasi-natural character of the nation in order to counter the South's uh, perspective on this question. Um, but Lincoln seems at the same time to be rejecting the example of our fathers who, after all, did opt out of their previous political allegiance. How can Lincoln reconcile his embrace of the fathers and his rejection of the Southern position? So far, we cannot say. Uh, but um, I, this theme will, uh, will appear later on, reappear later in the address. The nation which the fathers became pregnant with and gave birth to was dedicated, he tells us, to that proposition that all men are created equal. Not merely founded in the truth of it, not merely founded in the truth of it, but dedicated to it. Dedicated, I think, is the key word that pro propels the Gettysburg Address forward because it implies an ongoing and an active commitment. It captures the notion that the grounding in, its, in this truth in the past continues to set a task in the present and the future. 
and thus it sends us forward in this text into the second and third paragraphs of the speech in which Lincoln develops what this dedication means for his audience's present and for the nation's future. Um, I intended actually to do what, I don't know how many of you were at Stephen Kautz's talk this morning, but he stopped in the middle and had some discussion and then went on with the rest of it. And I'm tempted to stop here just to be sure uh, that you don't have any questions, because I think what I've been saying might be obscure. Um, so uh, if there are any questions that you'd like to pursue or perplexities that I've left you with, this would be a great opportunity to try to make me clarify them. Anybody want, or you just want me to go on? Uh, gentleman in the back. How prevalent was the uh, comparison between the South seceding and the American Revolution very. at the time? In the South, very prevalent. This, they used, they appealed to that as their authority. And if you read some of the secession uh, uh, resolutions that the Southern legislatures passed, they, they, uh, they recited to that all the time. Yeah. Yes. yeah I was going to ask, um, why can't, or what do you think about the, the idea that there's fathers and then you conceive that liberty is actually the mother figure and um, the nation is the kid? creating a natural family unit. And, and you're taking liberty as like Lady Liberty, lady personified liberty, liberty yeah. something then, like that. One could, well, I mean, conceivably one could argue, one could argue it that way, although I, I don't think liberty carries that kind of personifi personification meaning, but um, possible, I suppose. Okay, I'll go on then. Um, I'd like, could you do the next slide, because I, um, Oh, yeah, I go beyond into the. It's an explosion meant to evoke the war that they were in the middle of. You have to hit it again, I think. Okay, now here, as I've already pointed out, the second paragraph begins with an emphatic word, now, that distinguishes it very much from the previous paragraph. Lincoln and his audience have now left 1776. And they stand immersed in 1863, in that present moment. And in the second sentence um, of this, <laughs> coming on very slowly here, we are now met. We are now at the present in pre present time, but also now here we are in this very place. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. Um, so Lincoln and his audience are in the present time in the present place in a very emphatic way. But the present time and the present place in which Lincoln and his listeners are immersed is not independent of the past that he has invoked so insistently in that first paragraph. The present time and place are defined by their relation to that past, because the present reality is this, quote, great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. The present. This present crisis is a direct inheritance of the founding moment and its dedication. Lincoln is saying something that runs sort of at odds with the general tone of the first paragraph. The, let should we say, the legacy of our fathers is at best a mixed one. What they have handed down to us is this war. <coughs> what they have handed down to us is not necessarily a self-sustaining enterprise. It may not endure. Now Lincoln sees in this war, therefore, not merely a conflict that has arisen within the nation, but rather a conflict arising from the very identity of the nation, from its conception and from its dedication. The Civil War is a test of the endurance power of a nation so conceived and so dedicated. But he does not tell us here exactly how this is so. And here's a place where the brevity of the Gettysburg Address gets in the way, I think, of understanding what Lincoln is about. It prevents it from being completely self-contained. Now, the historical context of this speech suggests at least two different ways in which this great civil war is a test of whether any na this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. The first way is, in a way, the most obvious never mentions the word in the speech, but everybody has it in their, in their minds, that word is slavery. Uh, that nation may have been brought forth, Lincoln says, in dedication to equality, but it did contain from the onset a most central challenge to that dedication, that being the institution of slavery. 